This presentation will cover the emergency medicine basics of hyperosmolar hyperglycemia state. This lecture will closely mirror the American Diabetes Association and Diabetes Canada guidelines. I will use many abbreviations throughout the presentation. Please refer back to this slide if needed. HHS or hyperosmolar hyperglycemia state is more common in type 2 diabetes patients and also elderly patients which closely mirrors the trend of the changing population in Hong Kong. An admission for HHS costs far more than a year of insulin therapy so this shows why prevention and awareness is very important and can be cost effective. HHS has a higher mortality rate than DKA. With DKA, patients come in because they don't have insulin in their body. With HHS, it is mostly common due to another disease state that causes HHS. So when patients come in with HHS, you are often not just treating HHS, but also treating what caused the event to occur. This event that causes the HHS is most commonly either inadequate insulin or noncompliance or an infection, commonly pneumonia, UTI, or sepsis. Other acute illness can induce HHS as well as numerous drugs, including beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, steroids, other immunosuppressive agents, phenytoin, thiazide diuretics, olanzapine, among others. Dehydration is more severe in HHS than DKA. The table on the bottom right shows the average fluid and electrolyte disturbances in DKA and HHS, and you can see HHS generally has more significant disturbances. 50% of deaths associated with HHS occur within the first 48 to 72 hours of presenting to the hospital. Neurologic deterioration primarily occurs in HHS patients with an effective plasma osmolality above 320 to 330. Coma won't be seen until serum osmolality is above 330 or 340. It is fairly rare to see a patient in a coma from HHS. Abdominal pain is far more common in DKA, with over 45% of patients having it as a complaint as opposed to less than 15% of HHS patients. This is one of our biggest distinguishing factors before we have any lab results back in the A&E. Many labs are ordered to monitor HHS with the common ones listed here and additional labs based on what may be the precipitating cause. You have probably seen a table similar to this showing the differences between DKA and HHS. HHS has a much slower onset, higher glucose levels, a higher pH, and bicarbonate values. Urine ketones will either be negative or maybe 1 plus, and the serum osmolality will be very high. 33% of patients present with a mixed picture of DKA and HHS particularly if the precipitating disease state in HHS is altering some of the lab values or symptoms that may make it look more like a case of DKA. There are three main components with HHS treatment, as bicarbonate is only for DKA and not HHS. The first thing to do in the A&E is to start the patient on normal saline once cardiogenic shock has been ruled out. Then you adjust the fluid based on the serum sodium level. After the initial liter, 
assess the serum sodium. If high or normal, switch to half normal saline, or if low, continue with normal saline. Once the serum glucose level is below 16.7, then you need to add dextrose to the half normal saline. Protocols may vary slightly from hospital to hospital, but in general, these are the basics of therapy and should be highly similar from site to site. The second treatment is insulin. Using regular insulin, usually the patient receives a weight-based bolus, then an infusion is started, and it is expected to lower the glucose level by around 3 to 4 millimoles per liter. If it doesn't, then the rate should be increased or doubled. Once the patient's glucose is below 16.7, you not only change the fluids, but you also reduce the insulin rate by 50 to 80 percent. The goal is then to keep the level between roughly 12 to 14 and usually by this point the patient is sent to the ICU. The usual time frame is about 24 to 48 hours of continuous infusion of insulin. The third component of HHS treatment is potassium. If the potassium is low, then insulin must be withheld until it is within normal range by giving 20 to 30 milliequivalents or millimoles per hour of potassium to the patient. Once the potassium level is within normal range, the insulin can be started and 20 to 30 milliequivalents or millimoles of potassium should be added to each liter of fluid. If the potassium is greater than 5.3, no potassium is required. However, as the insulin you are administering will dramatically push potassium back inside the cells, you need to continue monitoring potassium levels and be prepared to supplement if needed. Do be cautious with replacing potassium in renal failure. Also, please note that the values may vary slightly from hospital to hospital in Hong Kong. As an example, here is the potassium replacement instruction in Prince of Wales Hospital. The guidelines say to use 20 of potassium for a level of 4.5. However, Prince of Wales Hospital will only use 10, which would likely underdose rather than overdose. So the pharmacist should monitor and recommend additional supplementation if needed. This slide is the same information, just provided in a different summary format. So where does the A&E pharmacist come into play and help with the care of the patient? Often, our input will be to make sure that we are not only treating the HHS, but ensuring practitioners are not forgetting about and are properly treating the inciting event, such as vasopressors for shock or sepsis, or antibiotics for an infection. Also, often, in practice, clinicians prefer to play it safe and often underdose potassium. Lastly, patients that remain in the A&E for a longer duration are at an increased risk of being improperly treated as deviations from protocol more often occur after four hours when the patient is more alert and oriented. These are the references for this presentation. Thank you for watching.